Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for the first campus conversation of this academic year. I can't tell you how happy I am to be talking about something other than budgetary challenges or COVID-19. So I do think we're really turning a corner on COVID, and this today is a start of a new and exciting chapter in Stony Brook history, because we're gonna be talking about making investments instead of cuts, hiring instead of attrition, and really looking forward and planning what comes next for this great institution. As I talk with people this fall, I certainly sense a greater degree of optimism, of hope, and a sense that exciting things are coming. So when I was hired, I told you all that I was committed to a number of things, and one of those was unleashing our ambitions, also expanding our research, and enhancing our academic success, and ensuring that we continue providing cutting-edge clinical care. So today, we're gonna talk about some of the work that we are doing to enhance our research portfolio. And with us today are a great panel. Our topic today is accelerating research at Stony Brook, and I'm gonna serve as a moderator and share your questions. So our panelists today are Paul Goldbart, our Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and our Provost, Rich Reeder, Vice President for Research, and Alfredo Fontanini, Professor of Neurobiology and Behavior, who's recently been appointed as Stony Brook's first Vice Provost for Research and Infrastructure. I'm so glad you're all with us today. Now today's meant to be a conversation. We received a lot of questions beforehand, but if you would like to submit additional questions, please put that into the Q&A feature. We'll get to as many as we can, but as I said, we had a lot stacked up before we even got going this morning. And last I heard, we had about 400 people signed up for this morning's conversation. So I know there's a lot of excitement. So first, let's begin by my addressing a little bit about what we mean when we're talking about accelerating research at an institution like Stony Brook. In other words, what do we mean when we talk about research? And what we mean is that we're talking about all the disciplines, including the humanities, the social sciences, and the creative arts. When we are talking about research, we are talking about the work of our faculty across all disciplines. We are talking about our English professor who's writing a book on Indian captivity narratives. We are talking about our historian who is writing about race um, and race relations between India and Africa. We are talking about our soprano who is at work preparing for performance with one of the world's great opera companies. And we are talking about our economist who is working on the effects of COVID-19 through network simulation and big data. We are also talking about the interdisciplinary nature of our research, the ways in which we need all of our disciplines coming together to tackle some of the greatest challenges that we are facing. How we are thinking about not only climate science, but climate solutions and the impact of climate change on this world. The ways in which across disciplines we can think together and work together on the disparity in healthcare outcomes. The ways in which we can come together across disciplines to think about injustice. And these are vitally important conversations for us to be having right now. So that's what we're talking about when we're talking about accelerating research, that is supporting our faculty across all of our disciplines. Paul, is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, I, I couldn't agree more, uh, Mari. Having this full spectrum of research is so incredibly exciting here at Stony Brook. I think it's what really makes these comprehensive universities that reach across the whole spectrum so incredibly, incredibly exciting. I mean, if you think here uh, at uh, Stony Brook University, we have ethicists and philosophers, we have microbiologists and ecologists, anthropologists, chemists, linguists, neuroscientists, humanists, we have physician scientists, all striving to, striving to create new knowledge, all striving to understand the world more deeply, uh, many striving simply to elevate the human spirit. And I'll tell you, 
Uh, it's what uh, drew me here from a, a very science-centric position uh, at my former institution as a Dean of a College of Natural Sciences to really have the, uh, the joy and luxury of working with the full range of things that we explore here. So uh, it, it's a remarkable, remarkable experience. And I'll tell you that the breakfast that I've been having uh, two or three times a week with various departments across the campus have really borne out this excitement of the research that's going on across the full uh, range here. I've had these inspiring conversations with people in music and people in history and other disciplines learning from them about what really makes their hearts pound. What is it that gives them enormous satisfaction and joy and draws them to their scholarship, their research? And, and really, if you look sitting here, you as a humanist, me as a physicist, I think somehow this is really proving the point that Stony Brook really is fascinated by, fascinated by and deeply committed to the full spectrum of research. Yeah, so following up on that, what is it that we're going to be doing differently to accelerate our approach to research? Yeah, well, we're really doing quite a lot. It's a very exciting time for research, and I have terrific partners here uh, who will be talking in great deal, Rich and Alfredo, more with us as we uh, progress through today's conversation. But I want to begin uh, with a very exciting uh, uh, news that we uh, have given the green light to begin moving ahead with faculty hiring. It's something, of course, that's incredibly important for universities, this process of renewal, this process of identifying what we're really excited in and what we must move forward in and do. So we've, uh, we're giving the green light to hiring more than 50 tenure and tenure track faculty uh, this year and next year, really to arrive uh, more or less by uh, September of 2022. Uh, at least 35 instructional faculty as well to really uh, add uh, heft to the critical role of our instruction uh, that we're about that we do here that we deliver. So how did we get there? What did we do? Well, we developed a whole new process, a multi-year all fund strategic bu budgeting process, and we worked fiendishly hard with the faculty and deans, members of the provost office, and and others uh, all summer long. We had presentations from the deans where they really expressed the vision that has emerged through deep conversations with faculty, chairs, staff, and others. We analyzed all the requests that came in in great detail, line by line, really trying to understand the vision that was emerging across the campus. And we also looked for thematic convergence, areas that were not uh, neatly within disciplines. Uh, we all know that this kind of overlay between disciplinary expertise and departments broke down long ago. So we made uh, made sure we were looking for thematic convergence across campus, areas like artificial intelligence, cancer research, quantum science, and technology. So all this got woven in and enabled us to position us in, in a way to move forward with this uh, faculty hiring. And of course, we're coming, uh, hopefully, coming out of COVID. We're coming out of uh, deep, deep uh, uh, complex financial issues, but it's fabulously exciting to be moving forward. All of this developed through a great deal of conversations with faculty all across campus. And as you know, last year, the work of the Strategic Budget Initiative, which rolled on through the summer and continues now, profoundly informed all that we're doing uh, in uh, leadership activities uh, at uh, Stony Brook University. And in particular, I want to draw attention to the Research and Innovation Task Force, who told us what, what we need to do to ensure that research and innovation really thrive, really hum, and we find a way to, to really draw out the best and create the most fulfilling environment for our community here. So we engage with faculty across the spectrum, all aspects of the research that, uh, that is going on, could be going on here. But I want to focus in particular on the field of uh, creative arts, social sciences, and humanities, not just the field, the whole area of work in this area uh, at, uh, here at Stony Brook. And so I want to focus on that to, just to begin with, and I want to particularly acknowledge the outstanding work that was done over the summer by the Creative Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities Faculty uh, a Research Working Group. We call them CASH for short. They worked very hard over summer and they tried to figure out what we could do uh, at Stony Brook to really unleash the potential of faculty uh, in this uh, suite of areas. So I'm going to just highlight a few uh, ideas that emerge. They're things that we're moving forward with, things that will really lift people up and enable them to, to do uh, uh, even more uh, outstanding scholarship, be even more productive, and find even more fulfillment, both faculty and students. 
So we're developing new support structures for faculty and students. How is it that you navigate the web that enables you to find and, and access the resources it takes to really uh, unleash your potential? Uh, how is it uh, that you can uh, access uh, grants, National Endowment of Humanities, National Endowment of the Arts? Where do you go? How do you make progress? How can you ensure that your applications really hum so that they're received and are received well by the various agencies? How do we find mentoring pathways to ensure that early career faculty ha can move in this space effectively and learn how to, how to be successful? We also want to recognize and reinforce established proven elements, and I'll just particularly uh, put a spotlight on the Humanities Institute. It's uh, very popular amongst our faculty, serves the community very well indeed, and that's a place where we have to uh, increase uh, the resources and make sure that that organization really serves the community uh, very, very well. well. What else are we going to do? We're going to expand support for creative arts, social sciences, and humanities within the OVPR's office, within the office that uh, Rich leads. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to ensure that within that office, there are personnel who have tremendous expert, uh, expertise with regard to grants and fellowships and the various opportunities and, and, and mechanisms that are there to enable people to, uh, to really move forward with their research. And along the way, we've learned that uh, in some settings, I would say time is just as valuable as, as money. And so we need to find ways to unleash people's potential by ensuring that they have the time to really dig deep and focus on their uh, research activities. What else are we doing? Well, uh, seed grants uh, have proven to be very effective in various, in certain areas that we undertake research in. And we want to expand that more widely into the creative arts, social sciences, and humanities. Modest amounts of one-time funding to catalyze new activities, to bring groups of people together, to enable people to take, undertake pilot studies, to sort of get off the ground with something new, to position them effectively, to go and compete for resources so they can really fly and move forward with everything uh, they're up to doing. They are, they are keen, so keen and enthusiastic and well positioned to do. Also, there's mechanics. How do you go out the biz about the business of, a, of securing uh, resources to do your work? And so we're going to train early and other people, but especially early career, career people on my research, and pivot training, put together teams and ensure that people understand this pathway towards the res research support that one needs. And we're going to seek opportunities to bring together interdisciplinary teams. We're seeing now in these large, complex, multi-investigator proposals that there are critical roles to be played by people in the arts, people in the humanities, people in social sciences, as well as people in STEM fields. And so we're going to work hard to bring people together to create these uh, interdisciplinary teams. And I'll just uh, name, for example, artificial intelligence plus ethics. What an incredibly powerful combination of the humanities uh, and STEM fields. So we are and we must continue uh, continuing to build out uh, research and scholarship and cash precisely because work in the creative arts, social sciences and humanities absolutely has to be at the heart of Stony Brook's future. Well, I can tell you that uh, as a humanist, uh, I love hearing all of that. And I'm really excited to see the work of our faculty um, that's given us such a concrete set of recommendations that we're going to be able to move on a lot of those. Um, that's really exciting to see. Um, and I know as you've been thinking about ways that we can better support our faculty, you've also been thinking a lot about what is the role of the Office of the Provost and where might there be an area of need. Huh. Um, that would help unleash our faculty's uh, research productivity. And so I know you've created a new role, the Vice Provost of Research and Infrastructure. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I can. I'm happy to. So Rich and I had many conversations early on, and I think we came to the position that uh, the division between uh, offices of research and provost offices is somewhat artificial. So much of what we do really just needs to handshake and is handshaking very well. But I think we felt the need for something deeper and more, more profound and more proactive. Um, and so we created the position of Vice uh, Provost for Research and Infrastructure. And the philosophy goes something like this. Our faculty are the architects, the guides, the developers, all the research and scholarship that we do. On the other hand, the provost office is the place that sort of supports faculty, develops, helps develop them through the whole arc of a career, allocates resources, allocates faculty positions, 
creates opportunities for facilities, it assigns space and so forth. And given that all these ideas sort of tie up very neatly with research, it seems to make sense that the provost office should have a deeper and more profound connection to what's going on in the world of uh, research. And so having a person in the position to really be the chief liaison to create that back and forth as we think about space, as we think about hiring in the provost's office, to then connect really vigorously with what's going on in the office of the vice president for research seemed to be a need. And, and it was a need, and the need uh, is one of those ones that when you meet it, you suddenly think, how do we ever live without it? And that's the position that we're in right now. So we created the position to realize this vision of a collaboration, increased coordination between the offices, identify research opportunities that straddle the whole campus, create new capacity for faculty to explore and research, and particularly look for opportunities for different disciplines and departments to engage with one another. So that's what we want to do. That's what we are already doing. We're only uh, seven weeks in, and I'm delighted that Alfredo Fontanini uh, elected to join us in the Provost's office. I say in the Provost's office, he's really in both of our offices. He's brought to the campus, uh, as he has for uh, many years, tremendous energy, insight, focus on research in the Provost's office. And I really believe, and I think it's playing out already, that our faculty and our students and our staff are all the better supported at Stony Brook for having uh, Alfredo in this position of the Vice Provost for Research and Infrastructure. Thank you, Paul. That's really great to understand that. And we'll uh, come back to talking a little bit more about that later. Uh, but first, I want to turn to Rich, our Vice President for Research, and tell us a little bit more about Tiger teams. I've been hearing some about that. Well, thanks, Murray. I'm really excited to be able to talk about the Tiger teams. I think we're realizing already that what they're doing is enabling a kind of conversation across the research community that we've needed for a long time and something we need to sustain. So it is really exciting. Before I talk about that, might be useful for me to give everybody an update on the federal funding landscape for research out there. And the reason for that is because this has influenced how we've been thinking about the Tiger teams and what we want them to do. I think most people realize that there are two important pieces of legislation in Congress right now. And it turns out both of these are signaling significant increases in funding for research. It's the Infrastructure Bill and the Reconciliation Act. That's how they're really known. So together, these bills have provisions for tens of billions of dollars in new funds for research and development, including standing up new programs. So agencies like NSF, NIH, Department of Energy, NASA, Defense, would all see significant budget increases. And some of the priority topics that have been highlighted are very important for us. Climate, clean energy, quantum information, and of course, health-related topics. So there's another bill that we've all heard about too. It's called USICA, the US Innovation and Competition Act. It was passed by the Senate some time ago, uh, and it actually even proposed a new directorate in NSF. Now, the latest intel on that is that that bill probably not going to go forward as a standalone item, but very significantly, some of the elements in that bill are now in the reconciliation bill. And this is important because the USICA bill had broad bipartisan support. Both aisles of Congress clearly recognized that the research enterprise in this country, including universities, needed to have better support. So another important thing that came out of the USICA bill is that they identified 10 focus areas that needed to have additional funding. And as I pointed out, these are strongly aligned with growth in NSF. And these 10 focus areas are what we really use to define these Tiger teams. That context is enormously helpful and I think helps all of us understand why it is so important that we are constantly paying attention to federal legislation, understand the details of what is being written in it, and that we then 
are really ready as a campus to respond when these opportunities come our way. Mm -hmm. So now that we understand the context for the creation of the Tiger Teams, can you tell us a little bit more about what they are specifically and what we've asked them to do? Yeah, happy to do that. And, and I think those viewing, you should be able to see now a list of these 10 different areas that were identified in the USICA bill. And I do want to emphasize these were aligned strongly with growth in the National Science Foundation. And so this really started as a pilot project sponsored both by Paul's office and my office. We wanted to construct teams of subject matter experts. We wanted them to be small groups so they'd be nimble. And the idea behind these teams is to be able to prepare our faculty to respond to funding opportunities before they're announced. Because what we've learned over time is that if we wait for a public announcement of a funding opportunity, it takes an enormous amount of time to put together a team to find the right partners to be competitive. It's often too late if we wait until it's publicly announced. So we ask these teams to do three things. Look around the university and even look beyond the university and identify what our strengths are. Who are our expert faculty? What do they do? And in addition, do we have any distinguishing facilities, research labs or capabilities that really give us an edge? Then we asked our faculty to use their expertise in their area and kind of look around the corner and forecast what are the opportunities that are likely to be coming up next. And then what we did is to ask them to map our strengths onto these anticipated opportunities. And that really does two things for us. It allows us to see where we have a competitive edge. And in addition, it also shows us where we may have gaps. And that can be very important because it can inform future investments as we go forward. So I'm happy to say that actually two weeks ago, we completed the midpoint check-in. Paul and Alfredo joined me there. And I have to say, listening to the teams give many reports on what they did, I was just amazed at the depth of thought that they had put into this. And I think we're realizing already that this is a model that we want to sustain. The reports from the teams are due next month. I think we're all excited to see what they're going to say. And another thing, discussions that we've had amongst us, we're now really committed to supporting these multi-PI groups that emerge from this initiative. And that can mean new hires in these areas. We want to be very strategic and lever what these leverage what these teams have done. The other thing that we're doing is recognizing that we can use this model now to look at funding opportunities in other areas. For example, in health-related areas. So right now, with very much Alfredo's help, we are looking at standing up a new suite of Tiger teams to address funding in health areas to capture some of the new NIH funding. That's really great to hear about that, and, and we look forward to continuing to hear more as, as these initiatives develop. Um, but I will say that I remember uh, from the Strategic Budget Initiative and the work of the Research and Innovation Task Force that we heard some frustration from our researchers, that we heard about barriers that were in their way, the ways in which they needed more administrative support. And so I'd really, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit more about what we are doing to try to address those concerns. So that's right. I'd really like to acknowledge the work that the Research and Innovation Task Force did. They listened to the faculty, they heard the concerns, and then they tried to identify what the hurdles are to productivity, and they tried to make recommendations on how we can accelerate the process of research through collaborations. And there are a number of things that come out of that, and I can give you a little update on some of the progress, particularly hiring in my office. Just in September, we hired two new positions into the Office of Proposal Development. So that's really important because the proposal development team is there to support faculty putting together complex proposals. 
what they do is to relieve the faculty teams of the burdens of putting together the administrative parts of the proposal so that the faculty can concentrate on the science narrative. That's really what they should be doing. So we will be adding additional positions to proposal development in the next two fiscal years. In addition, we're also currently recruiting for four new positions in sponsored programs and grants management. And you'll recognize those are the pre-award and post-award areas in my office. So what's important here is we recognize there's a need to provide support across the entire life cycle of an award. Faculty need that. So to give you an example, adding staff in those areas will help us accelerate submission of proposals, closing on contracts, including clinical trials contracts. It'll help us expedite complex tasks where we have to communicate with other offices across campus, like human resources, accounts payable, or travel. The other thing we're doing is to try and improve the process of hiring postdocs. We know that faculty are frustrated with the current model that's in place. It lacks the flexibility that many of the PIs want to have. So actually, I'm, I'm very pleased that Alfredo uh, is now developing a working group that will streamline hiring and recruitment of postdocs. And I believe we'll end up with a new postdoc hiring track in parallel with the existing model. And this could be approved as early as this fall. That's great to hear. Thanks for that update. Um, I love being able to see that the recommendations we received last spring are already really making progress um, and that we are seeing action resulting from that. That's really great. I know that the new staff are going to have a big impact um, on the work of our research teams. So, Alfredo, I'd like to turn it over to you and hear a little bit more about some of the work that you've been doing. Can you tell us about the new Strategic Research Council and what its objectives are? Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to be very happy to, to tell you about that. So first, let, let me tell you, uh, I'll have to admit that throughout my career as a, as a, as a faculty, I, I've never been the biggest fan of, of committees. I mean, you know, in a way, committees for, for a faculty, for research active scientists are, are a distraction from research. And, and so the irony that uh, uh, one of my first actions as a, as a vice provost uh, was to actually create a committee is not lost on me. I'm sure that my previous chair is actually uh, giggling about this. So, but, but there's a very good reason, I think, uh, because for, for starting the Strategic Research uh, Council. And that's because it critically addresses uh, a recommendation from the Research and Innovation uh, Task Force. So we heard a lot about this, uh, this task force. And this is really a blueprint for, uh, for much of my work in the, in the office. And uh, I think it expresses the needs of, uh, of the faculty and the research active faculty very well. And in particular, one of these needs was the need for a standing committee on campus that would advocate for, uh, for research and for research support in administration. A committee uh, or a group that would uh, identify the challenges, that uh, would identify the opportunities and do something about them and really advance and, and uh, provide actionable advice. And so that's why I decided to create this committee. And of course, you know, it's the office <laughs> that did that. It's not my action alone, of course. And so the committee is composed by the associate deans for research of all the schools and, and colleges, uh, Paul, the provost, uh, Rich, and, uh, and myself. We meet on a, on a monthly basis. We, we already had our first meeting a few weeks ago. The overarching goal is really to uh, support research here at Stony Brook. A more practical goal and ambition of, of ours would be to, to increase, help increasing research expenditure at, uh, at this university. And I think we can achieve that if we are, if we do a good job identifying key teams, key groups, or key projects that either are already successful or even more challenging and interesting for me would be to identify groups that are near the inflection point, uh, that we can uh, make them surface above the radar and, and support their research and their, their efforts. Of course, I also think that it's extremely important to, to carry on the, the spirit of the Research and Innovation Task Force. 
uh, that critical uh, energy, that connection with the, uh, with the faculty, and keep uh, advancing some of the recommendations of, uh, of the task force, but also keep analyzing the landscape, okay? collecting information, and really addressing challenges and, uh, and opportunities in a, in a timely and consistent fashion. So I hope this committee really will, uh, will help us with, uh, with that goal. So I know that another of the issues that came out of the Strategic Budget Initiative was a concern about research space and a lot of questions about that, how it is best utilized, how we make decisions about what and when facilities get upgraded. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you're thinking about we're gonna address some of those concerns. Yes, so it's, it's not a coincidence that the name of the position that, that I'm serving in is research and infrastructure because the two components are really uh, intermingled and need to be coordinated very well together. So we do have challenges in the infrastructures area. Uh, at least I can think of, of three big challenges. So the first one is uh, we are in an aging campus. Many of our buildings are several decades old. And not only they may not be able to support all the full force of the research that we're producing on this campus, but sometimes they may even hinder some of the research. So we need to be able to uh, renovate uh, those buildings. And of course, renovating buildings is easier said than done. Uh, it requires a tremendous uh, effort in, in gathering funding for doing so. And once you have the funding, the hard part of the job comes, which means how do you renovate a building without interfering with the ongoing research? These are tremendously big problems. And uh, in order to solve these problems, we need to be able to plan over a, a long time of period so that we can have a timeline for the kind of renovations that we want to do and we can have proper plans in place for uh, avoiding disruption of research. So that is one of the big challenges. The second challenge is a research intensive university like ours needs cutting edge research facilities and cores. There's the absolute need of constantly innovating on that technology. At the same time, we need to do that in, in a way that doesn't create a financial sinkhole. It needs to be financially sustainable. It needs to generate grants and create structures for supporting this innovation. And the third problem is, uh, uh, is a problem uh, related to governance and management. So across campus, we don't have much of an homogeneous model for uh, research space and infrastructure governance and management. Now, this may sound a little bit of uh, administrative alchemy, but in reality, if we don't have ways to connect uh, the inhabitants of our buildings, the researchers, with the administration, there's really no communication. So needs will not be heard and we'll, there's no chance for the administration to satisfy the, uh, our needs as faculty. And so I think that putting a clear governance in place will really make everyone's life much easier. So we're working hard on, the, on these challenges. And uh, I think for start, the position of the Vice Provost for Research and, uh, and Infrastructure creates a liaison between the Provost Office and, and the Vice President for Research on the one side, but also the Provost Office and uh, Facilities and Services. And in fact, in addition to working very closely to, uh, with REACH, I also work very closely with, with Dean Tufts mm -hmm. uh, in order to create that, that liaison. Every work on our facilities need the input from the faculty. And, and I feel that responsibility and that, that work. Uh, the other uh, step, concrete step that we're taking is we're uh, uh, assessing, engaging in a very comprehensive assessment of the quality of our space. What is the timeline of renovations for our buildings? How are uh, um, the, the, the quality, the, 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 the level of the infrastructures that we have in place right now? And so for this, which is a very, very comprehensive job, we are engaging with some external partners that can provide help that right now we, we don't have in-house. And then the third part of, uh, and I think the third uh, solution to this problem is really uh, beginning to look very, very carefully at the governance structures across campus in order to provide homogeneity and, uh, and a way for the administration to really listen clearly and, uh, and manage the, uh, the space needs. 
we're going to conduct this analysis. It's going to help us understand the space we have, how it matches up with the researchers who are occupying that space. We're, it's going to help identify what our needs are. Then what? What happens after we do this analysis? Well, yes. I mean, we take very obvious, as I think the, the strategic budget initiative is showing and the research and innovation task force is showing, we take very seriously recommendations uh, that, are, that are coming to, to, to help supporting research. So we will uh, uh, work toward implementing uh, the recommendations. Of course, once we have, a, I think, a timeline of, uh, for instance, the renovations needed, the first course of action would be to begin lobbying for, uh, for funding support. And th that is a difficult part, but I have to say that uh, the, uh, the team of, uh, uh, of uh, Dean Tufts and, and Bill Herman has been extremely successful over the past few years in, in lobbying for funding uh, with, uh, with SUNY. And so while past history is never a guarantee of, of future success, it's encouraging in this case. So I think that the first step would be really come up with a clear timeline for what are the buildings that are in need for, uh, for renovations. And then all the other recommendations, uh, I can assure you that we will work very hardly to, to implement them. Yeah, well, I have no doubt that this much more in-depth analysis of our needs will also help us be more successful in lobbying with SUNY. So I think this is a great next step. And so thank you for all that progress the, the, uh, that you in your position are making towards accelerating our research. So we're gonna turn now to questions from the community. We received a bunch before, you know, as, as sort of pre-registration for this event. And so we'll start with those. And there were enough of those. I, I don't know if we'll get to, uh, you know, all of the questions that are being submitted either before or during uh, this Q&A section, but we're gonna do our best to get as many as possible. So if you're listening online and you wanna submit a new question, please go to the Q&A feature. And if we don't get to them today, know that when we post this online and on our, on our Accelerating Research website, we will post answers to questions that, that we aren't able to get to. So I know we've touched on this some before, Rich, but we had a lot of pre-submitted questions that continue to talk about this issue around supporting our faculty through the life cycle of a grant. So can you please just revisit again the work that we are gonna be doing to support grant management? Yeah, ab absolutely. And I touched on this very briefly, but, but let me elaborate on that a little bit. The investments that are being made as a result of the Research and Innovation Task Force include hiring not just in pro proposal development, but also in the pre and post award areas. And, and as I explained before, that's important because we need to be able to support faculty throughout the entire conduct of research. And this is um, something that we're ready to do. Um, I can give you a couple of examples of some of the things that uh, it will allow us to expedite. For example, proposal submission. This is something that's extremely time sensitive. It, it is nerve wracking both for faculty and staff to make some deadlines. Uh, we also need to be able to set up awards, execute sub awards, pay the subs, set up salary offsets, deal with personnel transactions and requests for carry forward funds, no cost extensions, reporting and closeouts. Now that seems like a lot, but the point here is that there are a lot of very labor intensive steps in managing an award. This is where the new hires in grants management are going to be able to support faculty and what they need. That's great to hear. And you hope by the end of this academic year, you'll have these some of these additional new hires on board and working? Yes, we certainly expect that'll be the case. Yep, that's great to hear. So Alfredo, we've been getting a number of questions about incentivizing faculty, and particularly some questions about our faculty who are working on larger collaborative research projects when we have a reward system that often seems more focused on individual achievement. And I think that's a special concern for 
especially our assistant professors who really, and our associate professors who are interested in working on these larger projects, and yet a lot of things, particularly promotion and tenure criteria, seem to be more focused on individual achievement. So can you talk a little bit about how we're thinking about incentivizing collaborative work and some of those issues that, that are at play here? Oh, yes. I mean, that's a priority of ours. Early career faculty, junior faculty, that's, in my opinion, in my opinion as, a, as chair of a department, is the most exciting uh, stage of a career is when someone brings uh, excitement, openness, new ideas, new technologies. And so we want them as being part of our collaborative efforts. And uh, uh, the, the viewer is absolutely right. Traditionally, academia has not done a great job in many disciplines, not in all, uh, in, uh, in rewarding collaborative efforts at early stages. And so we very much resonate on this point. We are very aware on this point. In, in the provost office, uh, the team led by our Vice Provost for uh, Faculty Affairs, Mon Monica Bugayo, is really and is really thinking carefully and deeply about creating uh, assessment uh, tools and promo uh, promotion and tenure uh, guidelines that would value these uh, collaborative uh, efforts. In addition, though, to recognizing the individual role. Now, uh, I think this is an extremely important part uh, to do. We actually talk about, and it was requested even in, in recent big grant submissions, they want NIH, for instance, wants to see how we reward collaborative yeah. efforts. And, uh, and so we're very much uh, at tune of this. Fortunately, there are some areas in which uh, there's a good history of doing this. For instance, in, uh, in my field of, of neuroscience is growing, uh, this, uh, the acknowledgement of these team, team efforts in experimental particle physics it has been done for years where you have uh, papers with tens of authors and everyone in the, know, in the field knows the contribution of these authors. So there are precedents and there's the will and uh, we will work on, on recognizing those efforts because we cannot afford not to have our junior faculty enthusiastically joining our efforts. Yeah, so it sounds like we all have some really interesting conversations uh, back in our departments to be having um, about this balance between individual contribution and collaborative and how can we do the collaborative but recognize the individual and um, some really exciting conversations I'm sure we'll be having in the future around this. Um, so our next question, uh, comes related to our creative arts, social sciences, and humanities. Um, we are thrilled that we have so many of those people joining us today, and, and we've had some questions from some, including one who's asking that, um, sort of based on a lot of the research that we've supported in the past with seed grants or other opportunities, that it appears that this university values the physical sciences and medical research over social sciences and the humanities. What's your response to that? Yeah, so thanks, Mari. It's, it's, a, it's very reasonable, I think, for our colleagues to feel that way. Uh, and we, we certainly understand that. Um, I, I speak for all of us, I'm, I know, when I say that we are thoroughly committed to a Stony Brook that values uh, research, scholarship, and all related activities over the full spectrum of everything we do. I, I hope today's conversation has given some confidence to our colleagues that uh, that's exactly who we are and what we believe in, and the developments in Rich's office and in my office and elsewhere, uh, I, I am thoroughly confident we'll bear that out. So, so keep watching, keep asking that question, uh, and, uh, and, and take a look at the things we're doing. I've touched upon some of the support that we, uh, that we are planning to do to provide some of the approaches to uh, building up skills, uh, some of the enabling we're uh, really going to advance so that people have greater access and success with the kind of fellowships that give people the resources and time necessary to, to, to follow their dreams. Uh, so we're gonna be doing all that, as I said before, and happy to continue to have that conversation as we go forward. Thanks, Mari. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so let's see, this next question looks like, maybe I should probably put it to Rich. So I know you've already addressed federal funding, um, but there's also a question out there about corporate partners. And 
you know, we might have corporate partners who have some research budgets. They might be interested in connecting with Stony Brook. Are we doing anything to connect with business and industry? Yeah, that's a really good question, Mari. Thanks. We, we know that industry R&D funding is both significantly larger and growing faster than federal funding, and it has been. And much of that is relevant to the research that universities do, including Stony Brook. And we're right now at a point where we have started a process of realignment in economic development. And the primary objective of that is really to make sure that we are partnering appropriately with industry when we can. So we actually have a strategy where we are partnering our faculty directly with industry in focus areas uh, where we're researching. So it's still very early, but we actually have some initial success already in this area, including one project that's very relevant for our focus on clean energy. And I'm looking forward to seeing the outcome of that. It's also part of our strategy to take advantage of these industry connections because when we have strong industry partners, it can make us more competitive for going after federal funding as well. All right, this is another question. Looks like it's probably for you, Rich. Um, we're getting some feedback from many of our clinicians who say they wanna be more involved in research, but feel like they just, they have barriers in the way, they get caught in red tape. So what can we do to better support our clinicians who wanna be research active? Yeah, so these are, these are all really good questions. We're aware it can be difficult for clinical faculty to participate more in research. They have different responsibilities, different demands on their time, and it can be very challenging. Uh, there is a clinical research working group. It was convened in the summer, and in fact, it's focusing on this problem right now. They are identifying issues, and they'll be proposing solutions that'll make it easier for clinical investigators to engage in research. And there are lots of opportunities here. So I believe the report is expected sometime in November, and I'm really excited to see what it's gonna say. Yeah, I'm really glad to see that coming out of the Research Innovation Task Force, or whatever it was called, I'm now forgetting, yeah. from the Strategic Budget Initiative, that we also had these additional follow-on groups. First, the Creative Arts, Social Science, and Humanities, and now our clinical researchers, you know, some of these more specialized focus areas where our faculty have continued to engage, continue to help us understand what we need to be doing to support them. So we'll look forward to those recommendations and then following up on those after we get those. And we're really appreciative for faculty for those efforts. Yeah. This question looks like, maybe I'll throw it to you, Alfredo. It's related to the Tiger teams, but moving on from the Tiger teams we're currently doing to maybe a future more NIH related Tiger teams. Do you have a sense on what the timing of getting that process going might be? Yes. So. First, let me tell you, I was with uh, uh, with Rich and with Paul at the midpoint report of uh, of the Tiger team, and that was was very exciting, a wonderful uh, energy in uh, in in the room, a great sense of of uh, uh, really hope and direction toward these new areas, which is great, and uh, really made me and made us all want to uh, to to build more on on this model. This is a winning model. And it's a model where we, on the one hand, we need to uh, close this first phase in the existing Tiger teams with real and concrete support. And on the other, we need to expand it. And we do have a, a sense of urgency in, in expanding this model. First, because it's exciting. And when there's something cool, you want to <laughs> share it more. And also because we all know that NIH will receive a, a significant bump in its, uh, in its funding. And, and we want to be ready. And so we've already started some uh, initial discussions on key areas where we would like to, to have these Tiger teams. So of course, these discussions will involve the faculty. Uh, you know, nothing is done top down. And uh, uh, we're hoping to, uh, to get started with a new NIH-oriented uh, teams before the end of the semester. 
uh, right now, uh, Richard's office uh, uh, staff is really uh, very involved in, in working on, on the existing Tiger teams. And so we want to uh, somewhat bring the first phase of that to, uh, uh, to, to a slow wind down as we uh, design the second phase. And in the meantime, initiate the first phase for the NIH oriented. You know, on a more uh, lighthearted note, we're also discussing a little bit for what it matters, the name for these new teams. Uh, I root for chimpanzee teams because Jane Goodall <laughs> made the good points that tigers are solitaries and chimpanzees are sh social. And, uh, you know, I think it's fitting uh, coming from a biological uh, and anthropological angle. And, but hey, you know, I'm advocating in public my, <laughs> my opinion, so perhaps shouldn't be doing that. All right, well, we'll look forward to hearing more about our chimpanzee teams then, perhaps. All right, so I know that we've sent out a few updates about the Governor's Island project, but Paul, I'd love it if you could update us on that. And tell us what you think the involvement of planning for our Governor's Island response could actually mean for our research endeavors. Yes. So, so thank you. Governor's Island is a kind of code name that we've given to uh, Stony Brook's response to a request for expressions of interest from the city of New York and from the Governor's Island Trust to be an, the, the anchor institution that brings together the best ideas in the world to do with mitigating the enormous challenges that are coming with climate change. And New York City is the perfect place to undertake these activities for many reasons, including the fact that it is a site that is incredibly vulnerable and immensely dense in population, surrounded by water, subject to uh, storms with uh, increasing regularity. And so the idea uh, is to uh, create a community, a site there that is a convener, a creator of new ideas, a fosterer of conversations between all the key players. So who are the key players? They're the developers of solutions to climate challenges out there across the globe. There are people in STEM fields who are working actively to uh, design the next generation of uh, all sorts of solutions. They are people who are decision makers in government, in public policy, economists uh, and other social scientists helping understand how to integrate and move forward these ideas that are going to require the public's approval and funding to act, actually implement people in, uh, in, in uh, Wall Street, people involved with investing in companies and people involved with workforce development because this creates the opportunity to really set up an enormous and tremendously important new um, commercial enterprise as we build and implement the climate solutions of the future. So the idea is that Stony Brook University would be the chief convener of that conversation that also involves education of students, education of the public, education of teachers, and much more. So it has been absolutely stunning to watch the Stony Brook response, which is only three months old or so, because that's when the call for uh, expressions of interest came out. And led by Rose Martinelli, R Rose Martinelli and with a, a, a rolling up of the sleeves and a, a fantastic uh, hunger to get together and collaborate, tremendously talented people from across the whole campus have come together from all dimensions uh, to build what is an extraordinary proposal. And I really encourage folks to go online and, and just turn the pages and you will be so inspired by what Rose and company have put together. I'm absolutely thrilled by it. Uh, I think we have a great chance to be successful. We have uh, a fabulous partners uh, in our long-standing and amazing partner, Brookhaven National Laboratories. Or laboratory, but also uh, the University of Washington and Oxford University and other entities who've come together with us uh, to move this whole idea forward. Uh, and uh, I really hope that we'll be chosen as the anchor institution, but even if we're not, this fabulous example of the perfect case of interdisciplinary scholarship, research, and more I think positions us in this general area quite beautifully going forward. So one way or another, we have to be enormously active uh, in this uh, challenge of, uh, of our times. Yeah, that's just, it's been so exciting uh, to see how the community has come together and the work that they, are that they have done. Really happy to see that. All right, so a question that has come in from the chat 
is asking how the Tiger teams are involving faculty from the social sciences and humanities. Perhaps, Rich, you could address this one. So I'll have to say that the way we set up the first suite of Tiger teams, it was very focused on topics that came out of the National Science Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I have to also say that these were linked to a new directorate that was focused very much on translational applications of, of research. So many of these areas lended themselves to having engagement from social sciences and humanities. And members of those teams, we, in, we included faculty from these areas. Uh, I'd like to see how that turns out because I, I think for the next suite of Tiger teams, we'll definitely want to be able to include them as well. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so another question that's come in, um, you know, we've been talking about research all morning, right? That's been the focus of this conversation, but we have a question coming in about, are education and teaching then deprioritized? No, <laughs> not at all. Um, we, we retain and we must retain uh, absolute and abiding commitment to excellence, to brilliance in teaching. Why? Uh, we have uh, students who we owe it to to teach brilliantly, to move them up these intellectual edifices, to get them to new heights and discover who they are and how they can contribute to the world. We have stakeholders. We owe it to them. They pay some of the bills and it's very important that we meet the needs that they expect us to meet. Uh, we also owe it to our disciplines. Uh, those of us who have had, uh, been so fortunate to have academic careers uh, have steeped ourselves in and love and indeed endure, in, uh, just adore these disciplines. And, and I think it's our sacred duty to pass them on to the next generation in a, in a thrilling and wonderful way. So, so yes, research is critically important. So is scholarship. So is everything we do uh, in that sphere. But it's no more important than our teaching mission, which is fundamental to who we are. And quite frankly, I don't see these as either or. They are mutually reinforcing what we do in the classroom, often inspires what we think about in our research and vice versa. So they handshake beautifully. And our expectation, I think, always must be excellence in both. That's great. That's great. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. All right, so I think we're about out of time. I'd really like to thank Paul, Rich, and Alfredo for helping us understand better uh, the progress that we have made in accelerating research at Stony Brook University. Clearly, the work of the Research and Innovation Task Force has begun to bear fruit, and we're really excited to see that. And this is really only possible because of the support and enthusiasm and really the imagination about where Stony Brook's research portfolio could go and look like in the years ahead. And this has come from our faculty and we thank you for your engagement in these conversations. We listened during the process. We will continue to listen. We still have faculty groups that are working and making recommendations this morning was to update you on some of the tangible steps that we have already taken, but there's much more work to be done. And we are going to continue to move forward with enthusiasm, with engaging with you, listening to your questions, your concerns, your ideas, your suggestions. And we thank all of you for helping us get where we are and for where we're going to be going. So thanks for joining us today. <laughs>